Hello, everybody. So um, we have just a little bit more slides in Chapter 17 that I want to go over. Um, first, I'm going to show you the example calculation for this slide uh, that we called practice, of, practice for weak acid, strong base titration. So I'll show you what that looks like. Um, and then I'm going to discuss indicators and how to choose the right one. And then finally, we're going to have another video about um, solubility equilibrium. We've talked about that in the, in the past, but it'll be a review and kind of clarifying the, that a little bit. Okay, so we're going to do this calculation first. And um, so I've copied it into this whiteboard. And um, so when we're at the equivalence point of a weak acid strong base titration, the important thing to understand is that all of the acid is reacted. And so the only thing that's there is, is the conjugate. And you have an equal number of moles to what you start with with the acid. So in other words, um, we've done the calculation here that we have that many 0 0.0025 moles of acetic acid to begin with. If you're at the equivalence point, all of that is gone. And now you have that many moles of acetate, the conjugate. Okay, so that's what we're talking about um, in terms of like what's actually happening at the equivalence point. You don't have any acid left, but the number of moles of conjugate is equal to the number of moles of acid that you began with. So you use the volume and the molarity of the base to figure out moles of acid, essentially, and then convert that to moles of conjugate. And so the conjugate is what's going to determine the pH at that point. Um, so we have this same hydrolysis reaction that we've seen before. When you put acetate in water, it's going to make a little bit of acetic acid and some hydroxide. And that's why it's called a conjugate base. Um, so, in order to calculate the pH at this point, we need to use a traditional ice table where you have to consider the volume that you have at that point. And um, we're going to assume none of this initially that's going to form. Okay. Um, so, the volume at the equivalence point is going to be based on 25 milliliters of acid. And I noticed that the acid and base have the same concentration. So at the equivalence point, we'll have to have both of those present basically equal amounts. Okay, separate idea there. And of course, we want to convert that to liters in order to get a molarity. So You'll notice I don't drop off my significant figures when I convert to liters. We still have a tendency to do that. So um, we are using pretty careful measurements. Oh, although in this case, not as careful as we did actually in lab. So we can cross these off based on the fact that we only have three sig figs in the problem. But nonetheless, a lot of you are still going 0 0.05 liters instead of 0 0.0500. Okay, so like our molarity here is going to be that number of moles divided by liters. And so it's really important to do that before you plug anything in. The other thing to notice is this is a basic reaction, so we need to use a Kb. The Ka from Appendix D says um, this value. So naturally, to find the Kb, we're going to use the Kw. That's a four. There we go. So it's one times 10 to the negative 14 divided by the Ka from the text. And we get that. 
Okay. So this is a problem like you would, well, we first were introduced to this idea in chapter 15 of using the ice table. And um, we did it again in chapter 16, specifically to acids, especially weak acids and weak bases. So the real thing about chapter um, the, the real issue about chapter 17 is knowing when to apply each strategy. They're not new strategies. It's just being able to identify what part of the equal, equilibrium knowledge applies in different parts of the titration curve. Okay, so, so we end up with a molarity here of 0 0.05 0 .00 molar, and we have the KB, so now we're all ready. Um, The KB is going to be equal to the products over the reactants. Like that. And so in this case, we have X and X for our products. And our reactant is 0 0.0500. 0. And we know that's usually minus X. But again, we're going to use the simplifying assumption here because the K is very, very small, we know that when we subtract X at the end, it's not gonna make a big difference. So for our X value here, uh, I'm skipping some math, but I hope at this point that you are okay with that. You, you've mastered some of this stuff, but we get 5.3 times 10 to the negative six. Now I noticed a lot of us are not including the unit there, we should. And I also would note that that's a hydroxide concentration um, because our X is defined here. It's also the acetic acid concentration, but hydroxide is related to pH. So we can get to the pOH from that info. So we get 5.28. That's the pOH, right? So then we go 14 minus that. And we get an 8.72 as our answer for the pH there. Okay, so that's an example of what to do with a weak acid at the equilibrium point. Um, the other kind of characteristics we've already looked at. So like if you're at the beginning of a titration with a weak acid, that's a standard ice table problem. If you're in the buffer zone, that's a henderson hasselbach problem. Um, if you're at the equivalence point, here you go. And then of course, I guess the one thing we didn't do is at at past the end point, so um, when you have excess base. So that one is actually even easier. So let me just show you what it looked like. So like, let's pretend for this exact same titration, if I have added 27 milliliters of the base, um, what would it do then? So. So just again, to note, 25 milliliters represents the equivalence point. Okay, so, um, oh, and it's 0 0.100 molar. Oh, I think just that, actually. So here we are with that data. To figure out how many moles of extra base we have, we're just going to do your standard stoichiometry calculation. This should be review from chapter four. Okay, so we've added that much base. And so to figure out the excess, we will look and see how much was used. Oh, whoops, I missed a zero. Hang on, so that's 0 0.0027 moles. Okay, so we go back and we look and see how much acid did we figure out we had in the beginning. So that's 0 0.0025 moles. And so essentially, we're going to subtract those two numbers. So if we've added that many moles of base, this is a one-to-one -one reaction, so we can just subtract the moles of acid. So in other words, how much of this base reacted. 
And of course, that leaves us with a pretty small amount of hydroxide, but it's a strong base. So we don't really even need an ice table. It's just a matter of figuring out, okay, how much of that's actually present at the point we're at. And the other thing to consider is the total volume, right? So we have that many moles of OH minus. It's really tempting to just plug that into the negative log and then find pH, but it would be wrong. So we need to remember to add the 27 milliliters that we're at now plus the 25 from the acid. Okay, and so um, then of course we'll also convert that into liters. All right, so our answer here, it's a very small amount of base, but it, it, it will influence the pH. Okay, so now I'm ready to do the negative log of that number to get the pOH. which is 2.41. And then our last step to get to pH is to subtract from 14. So we have 11.59. So now you might've had 11.58 on your calculator, but um, what I'm doing on the calculator is keeping all of the numbers. I'm, I'm rounding what I write, but what I do is keep all the significant figures, um, all the non-significant figures rather in the calculator as I go. Okay, so um, even though really small amount of base is left over when we're just two mils past the equivalence point, we can see that that has a pretty tremendous impact on the pH. It does go up very high. Okay, so the last part that I wanna talk about is indicators in this video. And so if we look back at our lecture notes, and by the way, this problem was what we just solved. And then I added another one on to, to show you how to do the past the endpoint part of a titration. So um, there's two different vocab words that are important to understand. The first one is endpoint. That's when the indicator changes color. Okay, so endpoint is specific to color change. And the equivalence point is actually where um, all of the acid or base that you start with um, is gone, it's reacted. Okay, so also where the steepest part of this curve occurs, both of those two things. So in order to capture the color change near the equivalence point, you have to kind of know where that pH change is going to happen. So you can calculate it like we just did for the acetic acid and sodium hydroxide. Um, and then you want to look in a textbook, in a reference manual, to find out what indicator would work the best. So here we have two choices, phenolphthalein, and it says that the pH change from colorless to pink happens around 9. And we also have methyl or methyl red. They're different, not the same. We have a methyl red where at um, close to neutral, it's, it's yellow. And then around pH of five, it turns to orange. So if we had equivalence points that were in these regions, it would make sense to choose one of these indicators. If we're doing a strong base titrated with a strong acid, the pH at the equivalence point will be seven in which case like neither one of these indicators would be ideal. Okay, so that's the difference between an end point, which is where the indicator changes color, and, an, and the equivalence point, which is when all of the moles have reacted. Okay, so um, here's another example of a titration. We've done similar ones where you're starting with a weak acid and its pH changes um, past neutral, so somewhere close to nine, that means phenolphthalein is a really good choice of an indicator. I would not use methyl orange in that case because the methyl orange pH would change in the buffer zone, right? So selecting the right pH for an indicator will give you a great endpoint. Otherwise, otherwise it's not very helpful to have the indicator in there. 